Okay, welcome back. This is Issues in Biotechnology, the way we work with life. And this is the second part on applications in biotechnology. And we've been looking at agricultural biotechnology. And in the first part, we looked at specifically where does our food come from? Uh, from the history of agriculture, out through plant domestication and the plants that are produced for our grocery stores. Next, we looked at, in the second part, DNA-based biotechnology as it applies to modern agriculture and the foods that we eat and large-scale agriculture. In the third part, owing to this as a new technology, uh, we examined some of the issues, controversies, and concerns that that technology has brought to the public. And what I tried to accomplish in that section was to inform uh, the debate uh, about some of the controversies and some of the myths, and to debunk some of the mythology that's been created by uh, public perception. Uh, and I think this sets the stage about food and agriculture and how it's produced. So now I want to, in part four, evaluate uh, what this technology means in terms of ethics of agricultural biotechnology and large-scale food production in the United States and then eventually globally. But before we do that, uh, just to recap a little bit about uh, what's gone on so far, that we should recognize that nearly all of the plants that are available in our grocery store that contribute to our food supply do not grow in the wild, and they haven't for quite a long time now, uh, and that all of the cultivated plants are the result of human intervention through uh, selection from wild plants and plant domestication out through techniques that have been established uh, during the, the historic development of agriculture. And that we should recognize that these plants that we now utilize uh, would not exist without humans. They didn't exist before human intervention, and likely uh, they wouldn't exist if um, humans stopped their cultivation of them. So this process of domestication of plants uh, has derived modern agriculture through selection, genetics, the ability to use wide crosses, mutagenesis by chemical mutagens such as EMS, as well as fast neutrons to derive uh, new varieties. And now we have another tool in the box more recently, the ability to do gene transfer uh, and advanced genetics uh, owing to um, technologies created around genomics. But the public is confronted with a confusing picture of our food source. And as I mentioned, food is a sensitive topic because it's something that we all must interact with daily. Uh, so there are conventional foods, processed foods, organic foods, natural foods, whole foods, and this creates quite a confusing picture. And then we throw in, uh, confoundingly, uh, the effects on our health and our nutrition, and then global economic and environmental concerns. Uh, most poignantly, this is um, examined in the position of conventional farming versus organic farming. How should we produce the foods that we need as a society on a large scale. And large-scale agriculture is really a large part of this issue. Uh, we are a, a growing population and increasing. The population in the United States has doubled since 1962. The population globally has doubled since 1962 and will continue to increase. How do we meet the growing demands for a growing population sustainably? So this domestication of plants and the utilization of plants for agriculture has created a confounding picture 
uh, and that people presume that the plants in our grocery store are natural. <clears throat> and we can see where this perception comes from. Lettuce seems quite natural. It's something that we eat. However, iceberg lettuce is anything but natural. Uh, wild lettuce does not look or taste anything like iceberg lettuce. And all of the other varieties of lettuce that we now have available to us are um, the work of plant breeders over a long period of time. So I attempted to cover some of the controversies and concerns that are raised about the utilization of these technologies on our, as it applies to our food source. And I've been primarily concerned with plant agriculture here because this is where the interface now occurs. We should realize that plant-based agriculture also affects animal agriculture and that the plants that we grow are also used for animal feed. The majority of corn produced in this country is feed for cattle, the pork industry, and poultry. And this brings up an entire another topic that maybe we'll address in another lecture. But certainly meat production in this country is a large part of a backdrop to large scale plant agriculture. How do we feed the cattle that go into production so that the public is, has access to Big Macs? Uh, it's cheaper to buy a Big Mac than it is to buy a bunch of broccoli. And what, are, what is the reason behind that? How should we produce the meat that we produce? Should we be consuming the amount of meat that we consume? What are the health consequences? What are the environmental consequences? And again, this is a very large topic. Uh, as you know, um, meat production is subsidized by the corn and grain industry, but moreover, <clears throat> the utilization of antibiotics uh, in a, on a large scale encourages the selection of antibiotic resistant bacteria and this is questionable. However, this also creates a lot of uh, misconceptions about the use of antibiotics and the meat that we consume. Uh, and again, I think to clarify some of those topics requires further information and examination about how we produce meat and consume meat in this country. How should we produce the food that we eat? Uh, we assume that the food source is safe. And again, it's this aspect of large scale that comes to bear on commercial production over millions of acres of these plants. And I'm mainly concerned with plants here because genetic modification of plants has now been deregulated and is a part of the human uh, food chain, whereas genetically modified cattle and other animals are not yet directly uh, in our food supply, but certainly that technology uh, can be accomplished, it has been accomplished, it just right now is not uh, in the marketplace yet. Also, we will touch on in a later lecture the technologies that are applied to animal cloning. So animals can be genetically modified as well as cloned. And uh, we will evaluate that technology later in terms of its applications uh, and its ethics. And we examined in the last lecture organic farming, that the paradigm of organic farming requires no synthetic pesticides, no synthetic fertilizers, and no GMOs. We observed that organic products cost more in the grocery store uh, by as much as 50 cents on the dollar and in some places higher for comparable products. And we asked the question, why is that so? Uh, we can say that production of organic products is more costly because there is more labor involved. Human labor has to be involved with weeding. Weeds can be removed in conventional agri agriculture by the application of herbicides at a very low cost. But there are certain uh, contradictions, if you will, that are brought up into this paradigm.
Do we assume that organic food is better for you, or that it's safer, or that it's better for the environment somehow, contrasted to conventional large-scale agriculture? Or is this a mythology that is somehow propagated by public misperception as well as the organic industry? We can recognize some of these controversies, for example, in that it takes more fossil fuel to run an organic farm. It takes more fossil fuel per acre because tractors have to continuously go over and till that land. Moreover, in large-scale agriculture, the in invention of the application of herbicides like Roundup uh, has created no-till agriculture. The ability to re-till in corn stover every year to uh, reclaim some of the, that, that soil and organic material back to the soil and also preventing erosion that would remove large amounts of topsoil uh, lost every year. So no-till agriculture, due to the invention and application of herbicides like Roundup, uh, have been an environmental advantage. And considering pesticides, we could look at the canary in the coal mine as agricultural workers who are exposed to pesticides on a large scale. The guy that flies the plane that's delivering pesticides is probably exposed to more pesticides in one day than the average consumer is over a very long period of time. You would presume that if you were going to see health-related consequences due to these chemicals, that this would be a good place to look. Or the health-related health uh, aspects to their children, coming home to their children, their children play with their father who's been out on a tractor all day. And so uh, if you look at health-related aspects to agricultural workers, you can find uh, information related to consequences of long-term exposure to pesticides. And I'll just invite you to do that sometime. No synthetic fertilizer is another interesting component because there's no evidence that a plant can sense the difference between nitrogen that comes from miracle Grow or any other synthetic fertilizer and nitrogen which comes from uh, processed manure. No GMOs, as I said, is highly questionable. There's been no substantiated health-related consequences on humans worldwide from the consumption of genetically modified organisms. So it would seem that the onus then should be on the billion dollar industry of the organic farmers and their products to both substantiate their claims uh, and uh, the production practices of organic farming and related to uh, the proposed benefits. And then we evaluated some of the issues and concerns about biotechnology in terms of safety, regulatory issues, labeling, right of choice, environmental concerns, globalization, food culture and sensitivity, and a growing distrust of science, uh, particularly in the United States. And we went through these uh, one at a time, and certainly uh, this only covers uh, some of these concerns, and this is not meant to be an exhaustive uh, list of uh, concerns that the public has about these, but I meant to try to inform the debate over what I think is a school of red herrings uh, that abound when considering large-scale agriculture and our food uh, sources in general, whether that's organic or conventional. But I do want to touch on just a few uh, before we let that part pass. One question that commonly comes up when I talk about this subject is the uh, Terminator technology, so-called. Uh, the Terminator technology uh, was dubbed Terminator uh, not by its inventor, but rather by the opponents to genetically modified crops. The technology originally was developed by uh, Dr. Melvin Oliver, uh, a USDA worker, uh, looking at how to uh, encourage protection of 
uh, crops that have been improved by the industry, specifically on cotton. And uh, the technology was uh, developed um, to ensure that improvements of cotton would be uh, retained uh, and utilized uh, by, by the farmers. So the idea was that improved cotton, uh, which is grown for its fiber, which is produced at the end of the growing uh, cycle of cotton, that that seed would not be perpetually replanted and brown bagged by farmers. And uh, that might seem um, nefarious by the company to say, well, we want to prevent you from brown bagging and, and uh, saving that seed by, allow, by not allowing second generation seeds to be replanted. But let's consider this. I already gave you the model system for hybrid corn. That hybrid corn has increased yield uh, of corn, particularly in the United States, but globally, owing to advanced genetic selection, uh, improving yield uh, many fold over uh, by combining genetics of inbred lines. The farmer then cannot simply brown bag hybrid corn because that genetics then uh, dissipates and yield then collapses. The farmer then growing corn must purchase new hybrid seed uh, every year from the producer in order to benefit from the increased yield. This has benefits in uh, two ways. One, the farmer benefits from the increased yield. Two, the crop itself benefits because the producer is continuously improving that crop, introducing new traits like disease resistance that would be particular to a specific region. If the farmer continuously brown bag that corn, those new improvements likely would not be introduced into agriculture, and that crop would stagnate and eventually become susceptible to diseases endemic in that region. So therefore, the entire agricultural improvement system benefits by uh, improvements that are made genetically. And I'm talking about hybrid maize in this case. In the case of cotton, it's very similar. That if the farmer simply planted the same variety over and over and over and over through many generations, sooner or later, pests would uh, become uh, a serious problem for that crop. So also, if the company that is producing this new improved crop uh, could not benefit financially uh, from reselling uh, that seed, then no improvements would be made, and the company would not likely be encouraged to invest the millions of dollars that it took to improve that crop in the first place, again, stagnating the agricultural situation for cotton. Realize that BT cotton, and I brought up the example of BT maize, the, in, uh, the protein insecticide uh, that is derived from a gene uh, cloned from the bacterium Bacillus thuringiensis that is now expressed in corn to ward off European corn borer without using chemical pesticides. That same technology has been introduced into cotton. The, um, the pests on cotton uh, incur must require a large amount of chemical pesticides to control, or humans literally picking the Leptodopter and insects off of cotton. And when did we last grow large amounts of organic cotton? Well, that would be in the 19th century, when we had lots of available free human labor in order to accomplish large-scale production of organic cotton. The, Indian co the, the cotton industry in India nearly collapsed over uh, economic concerns over its production issues as well as its yield until the introduction of BT cotton. So we have to realize, I'm not just merely saying these things in support of the industry 
but to give you examples of how this technology has benefited agriculture. But wait, I'm really talking about Terminator here. Where did the name come from? What is the technology? The technology itself allows that the seed that's produced will produce an embryo in the second generation in that seed that will not germinate. We don't need to get into the particulars of how that's accomplished, but really it's a quite elegant technology at the, at the molecular and genetic level. It was misconstrued by opponents of GM crops that, oh my goodness, farmers will be prevented from replanting their crops. They will all be forced to grow this crop produced by this company. Well, that's not right. A farmer can grow any seeds he wants. If he wants the benefits that this crop produces for his agricultural situation and the financial benefits that that brings in terms of yield, then he's got to buy this crop. It's like if you wanted a BMW, but you couldn't afford a BMW, and you wanted the benefits of that, but you could only afford something less, you would not get the benefits of that car. Or think of it this way, that if you bought that car, and eventually this car wears out, would you expect the production of that car, the producer of that car, to merely give you a new car? I don't think so. That's just not how this works. So why shouldn't the company be compensated for the technology and the benefits that it brings? So the name Terminator, that's onerous. You know, why Terminator? You know, it brings up, uh, you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger or something, you know, and um, violent movies, you know, and that people, I've heard people, opponents of GM technology say, well, what if this technology gets out into wild plants and it, and it causes the death of all plants? Well, you know, uh, sterility is sterility, you know, and chances are really good that if your father didn't have kids, you won't either, you know? And so uh, I really doubt that a sterility mechanism is going to be propagated very far in the wild. So obviously that's a misconstrued idea. So um, the name Terminator was dubbed by an opponent of GM, but it stuck. It stuck and it's still propagated today uh, and misconstrued as industry taking advantage of, of farmers. And the same goes for other GM crops. The farmer is not forced into buying GM crops. The farmer buys GM crops because they yield more, and he receives a financial benefit from doing this. Farmers in this country are perhaps the best businessmen around. You know, they, they uh, are not unsophisticated as a stereotype might project. Hard from it. These guys do everything. So, I again bring up this quote from Giddings et al. from Nature Biotechnology that to our knowledge, every claim of negative consequence to health or the environment from the use of these crops has failed to withstand scrutiny. And I think this is a challenge to the opponents of GM crops to come up with the appropriate evidence that would somehow undermine or illuminate or inform us somehow about the uh, consequences or negative consequences of this technology. I think that the industry as well as uh, the farmers and the agricultural situation and the uh, regulatory agencies have done more than their share to substantiate their claims. Also from that article, it is imperative that the impediments that are now instructing in, in obstructing innovations in these critical areas be examined, and that those that cannot be justified must be removed. And this brings up the ethical imperative. For those that think this technology is uh, somehow um, a choice, needs to consider world agriculture and the dire concerns that now confront a growing population. And as I mentioned, the threat of pesticides. Um, 
not all pesticides are created equal. Some are toxic compounds with negative consequences. But let's consider this a moment. Um, let's consider a comparison of herbicides, for example. Herbicides are chemicals which kill weeds. Weeds detract from water resources for crops. If you don't take out the weeds, even a backyard gardener knows that this will have devastating consequences to what you're trying to grow. Everybody takes the weeds out of their garden. If you now are challenged with large-scale agricultural production in taking out weeds, it's your backyard garden on a huge scale. How do you do that? Are you going to do that manually? Well, right now, 4% of our population is involved in agriculture. How much of our population must be involved in agriculture if you're going to do that all by hand? So toxic compounds and herbicides. Years ago, atrazine was the uh, herbicide of choice, largely in the Midwest, to control weed populations in maize, soybean, and similar crops. Atrazine is a persistent herbicide with um, somewhat toxic effects in it lingers in the environment and in the aquifers in the Midwest even to this day. Bring on Roundup. Roundup. What is Roundup? It's an herbicide that is a systemic herbicide. It kills uh, broad range weeds post-emergently. And what is it chemically? Glyphosate. What is glyphosate? It's phosphorylated glycine. Glycine is one of the most prevalent amino acids in biology. Phosphorylated glycine. And the problem is, really, if you compare this to atrazine, I think we can say that this has been a huge improvement. Also, the application of Roundup has allowed no-till agriculture. And I've already explained the benefits of this. So, this has to be considered in terms of its pluses and minuses. Um, Risks and benefits. In a world where benefits are okay and risk is not okay. No risk? No risk? Really? What's no risk? You got in a car to come here. And this brings up a recent controversy that is now at our doorstep. Um, owing to the fact that Roundup, or actually any application of a pesticide, an herbicide, an antibiotic, will eventually select for resistant organisms. Darwin taught us this. I don't care what the selective agent is, it eventually will result in a resistant organism, whether that's DDT or penicillin. Eventually, there will be an organism which will evolve a mechanism to be resistant. And by its application, that is the selective pressure which will allow that organism to survive in that presence. So eventually, we will have Roundup-resistant weeds. This is already occurring. Now what? We are continually outfighting the pests. That is the challenge of modern agriculture. Another possible herbicide that can be applied by farmers on a large scale would be 2,4-D, 2,4-dichlorophenoxyacetic acid was discovered by a scientist at Yale University, Arthur Galston, uh, decades ago. As a synthetic plant hormone applied in large amounts will cause defoliation. That and another synthetic auxin, another synthetic hormone, uh, 245T, 245T, 245-trichlorophenoxyacetic acid, also acts as a plant hormone. And in a 50-50 combination, volumetrically, uh, this was produced by the United States to defoliate large acreage in Vietnam during the Vietnam War by aerial delivery in a program called Operation Ranch Hand. By removing and defoliating the jungle, they were able to see uh, combatants and so its application was widely applied. Unfortunately, 
a contaminant of producing the 245T and the 24D uh, that was applied in the compound agent orange contained um, <laughs> 2478-tetrachlorobenzodioxane. TCDD is highly toxic. As a dioxin contaminant, uh, it was responsible for illness and death in Vietnamese populations and probably in uh, the people that handled it during the Vietnam conflict in this country. Okay, enter in modern agriculture. If we have now the challenge of a new safe herbicide, and we know that 245T and 24D kills plants, and develop an herbicide that safely removes the dioxin, now we have the ability to genetically engineer plants that are resistant to 2,4-D and a replacement for Roundup. Already, this has been misconstrued. This crop isn't even out there yet, as far as I know, but I've already heard uh, by way of the guy that sells me coffee at the local coffee stand here in town that uh, a, a chemical company is releasing Agent Orange corn. You can already see what kind of media misperception this will already create. Terminator, as a technology, was never commercialized. In fact, I don't even think it was ever implemented. But still, people are concerned about Terminator technology. I will bet that you will be hearing about Agent Orange Corn soon and for a very long time as a ruse by the chemical companies to sell more chemicals to pollute our food source. Really? So, the threat of pesticides. What is it? Is it a threat to human health? Is it a threat to large-scale agriculture? How should we conduct large-scale agriculture in this country, globally? What are the health consequences to agricultural workers? Wouldn't you expect that if there is a consequence of exposure, that those people who are most exposed would be the canary in the coal mine? People that manufacture the herbicides and handle them also in factories that produce them would be much more highly exposed than the general public. Then the question is, do organic foods provide safety? from the low level of pesticides that you would be exposed to by consuming crops in the, in the grocery store. Think about the guy that's picking that food. The, the agricultural workers that are hand-picking that food to get to the grocery store are exposed to this on a large scale. It was pointed out to me by a friend of mine from Yale just yesterday that there are compounds in food, naturally occurring compounds in food, that are carcinogenic. Bruce Ames, the inventor of the Ames test for carcinogenicity, uh, wrote an article for Science, the journal, and it was published uh, as a cover issue that said, eat food, and, eat food and die, exposing that there are naturally occurring carcinogens in foods that we eat. Some of these are accumulated even through the plant breeding process. For example, that there are compounds in celery that when workers are exposed to hand-picking celery, organic or not, are exposed to compounds that celery produces that in an Ames test register quite high as a carcinogen. This is normal celery. Bread crust charcoal meat all contain carcinogens detectable on the Ames test. I will go into what the Ames test actually is in terms of its assay in a later lecture. Agricultural biotechnology crops can actually lower pesticide and chemical use. 
uh, owing to the fact that some of these approaches offer a biological alternative to a protein-based insecticide like Bt, and that these are safer compounds, and that these will use less fossil fuels and less drawing of the tractor over land, and uh, resulting in lower environmental impacts and lower soil damage. And also, this approach offers the ability to target pests specifically. Pesticides often kill broad range of species. The ability to focus on the biology of the situation allows targeting of specific pests. Again, leptidopteran insects killed by Bt rather than broad spectrum chemical pesticides that had been previously applied. And even in Silent Spring by Rachel Carson, who we owe a great deal to raising our consciousness about the environmental damage of DDT and other dangerous pesticides, informs us about the biological solutions that offer alternatives that have been contributed by the collaboration of entomologists, pathologists, geneticists, physiologists, biochemists, and ecologists, and now more recently molecular biologists, into the equation for producing safer uh, foods on a large scale. So will biotechnology help create sustainable agriculture or exacerbate the problems of large agribusiness and monoculture farming? Well, we have to consider that the underlying problem here is really population. As many of the crises that now confront our planet, a lot of this can be explained by a growing population. Let's face it, is there really a food crisis? Really? Because if it was just me and you, we would have plenty of food. We'd have plenty of land and plenty of water and plenty of resources. But that's not the situation. Is organic food really better for you? Is it really better for the environment? We think that the organic industry now owes us an explanation. Is organic solution viable for sustainable world agriculture? Can we really grow enough food organically to produce the amount of food that is now required? Should we be producing the amount of corn that we use to grow meat? That's another question. And if you wanted to do that organically, is that possible? So if you want your meat, can you have your cake and eat it too? Is really kind of the question. If you want to go towards sustainable agriculture, just stop eating meat. That would solve a lot of problems. Period. Can we really grow enough food organically, sustainably, to pull this off? My friend, who's a large-scale farmer out in Pennsylvania, just pointed out that organic farming produced at a large scale might be able to produce 0.001% of the food that we now produce. And it would require about 27% of the population in order to pull that off. And he's a farmer. And he has no invested interest in order to come up with a statement like that. And is it safer? I want somebody to prove that. I want to see evidence that it's safer. I want to see evidence that it's more nutritious. We have now seen incidents where organic food has actually caused food safety problems. Think back to 2005, 2006. A company called Earthbound Farms was responsible for commercializing spinach that was organically grown in the Salinas Valley that was responsible for an E. coli outbreak that sickened over 1,600 people to hospital and resulted in several deaths. What was the cause of this food safety problem? Well, one thing is, I'm not saying this was a cause of organic farming, but it was organic food. It was organic food. So organic food has sickened people. 
The same cannot be true for GMOs. GMOs have never sickened anyone. So what was responsible in the earthbound farm incident? Well, I had been to that earthbound farm production facility. I had seen how they produced that spinach. I was very familiar with it. For those of you that haven't been to Salinas Valley, it produces about 26, 27 percent of America's produce. It's large-scale agriculture in your face. You drive past miles and miles of agriculture produced on a large scale, and it's very informing. So you go to the earthbound farms, and it's spinach as far as you can see. And I heard on the radio that this spinach problem, this E. coli spinach problem, was caused by um, somehow the farm workers had contaminated this. And I thought, uh, this is highly unlikely. And the USDA quickly responded that it was an animal source of the E. coli that they detected in the contaminated spinach. Then I heard on the news virtually the next day in response to this that it was likely cattle that had contaminated the irrigation system for the earthbound farms. And I had been there. This land is flat. You could see a cow a half a mile away. There are no cows. So what was responsible? This certainly now has not been clearly defined, but likely the contaminating source was small baby pigs. Small baby wild pigs running through the spinach production field. How do you keep out small baby pigs? How do you do that? From any field, whether that's organic or conventional, or birds flying over, also contain contaminants. What are you going to do to stop this? Shotguns? Lots of them? Um, baby pigs can't be seen. How did they get in there? Well, that's wildlife, isn't it? So, um, but that's not the only incident. Once that E. coli spinach contaminant got into the production field, all the uncontaminated spinach was contaminated. So you've got a processing plant now that exposes large amounts of produce going through a central facility and the problem becomes further blown out of, out, out of control. And now think about the food safety issues that we've seen over the last few years. Salmonella onions and tomatoes sickened people from contaminated organic crops. Listeria contaminants and cantaloupes more recently. Certainly the news media does not come back and say organic is bad. Somehow we get the message that GMO is bad, but nobody's saying that we should put warning labels on organic food. Warning, this product contains organic material. Could food safety issues result from unprocessed manure? I can see that. Perhaps new organic food standards should use warning labels. Actually, I'm not being facetious about this. Um, what we really want, instead of these regulations that say what you can't use, we want safe food. Is that too much to ask? We want safe pharmaceuticals, and we demand safety regulations for safe pharmaceuticals, for safe vitamins. Shouldn't we demand the same standards for what we ingest every day, no matter how that's produced? Food safety is a big issue when we go to large-scale agriculture. There's no question about that. Huh. So that brings me to part four, ethics of agricultural biotechnology. And in this class previously, students have somehow responded to this like, ethics? There's ethics of agriculture? You know, there's ethics of war, there's ethics of crime, ethics of agriculture. This seems like, uh, really? Well, certainly, certainly, there are human lives at stake in this country and globally. And there's the environmental issue, ethics of the environment, responsible land management practices we owe to our children and our children's children. Stewardship of our environment has been an attribute 
that we should hold in high esteem. We are the stewards of our environment. This was a very good compilation addressing agricultural ethics in a changing world, edited by Martin Crispiels as he was director of San Diego Center for Molecular Biology a few years back. And I think uh, this offers an interesting view of how ethics apply to the agricultural production system worldwide. Fine for you to eat organic food and pay more for it uh, if you can afford to do that. But on a global situation, how should we produce food that is needed for a developing world? What are the risks? And how do we consider the ethics and the morals that apply to food production? What is the risk to our world view? Some of you may be old enough to remember the wheat embargo, where wheat was held in an embargo to the former Soviet Union to create policy change on a nonviolent basis. Not a bad approach as we consider violent conflicts now around the world. Is that a peaceful way of doing it? Not exactly either, is it? Global agriculture and the risk to human health. If you think about how agriculture on a large scale happens here and some of the controversies and concerns we've just been discussing raise, Think about the same health-related consequences when you don't have access to this technology. What are you growing your food in? How is that then how handled? We're worried about listeria contaminated cantaloupes. I think you're lucky to have cantaloupes. And what about risk to the environment on a global scale? At an ethical level, we should consider that given sufficient risk, most of us would proceed with extreme caution or not at all. And you can think about how that plays out on a very practical level. Real risk, getting in a car to come here, you consider that and hopefully you fasten your seatbelt. People die in automobile accidents you proceed with caution. If the risk was really more extreme than an automobile, you might not proceed at all. But what's the real risk? What's the perceived risk? And how does that influence, how does your decision influence the world globally? Can biotechnology be used to feed the poor? Well, that's an interesting question. Can we use this technology to increase world agriculture to a growing population? A growing population that will most likely increase in developing countries more than in developed countries. Why is that? Why is population increasing in developing countries more than it is in our country? Our country population growth is going to near zero soon. Why? And same is true for Europe, if not declining. Can we use the tools of biotechnology to alleviate hunger? And if you say no, what are you condemning people to? Given sufficient need, most of us would proceed with perseverance and survival. So counterbalancing risk and need needs to be considered. Fine for you to have access to the abundant food resources that we, are, uh, that we have accessible to us to make decisions for people who don't. Given sufficient need, if you said, eat this corn, now you're starving. It's GMO. I don't know what will happen to you in 20 years, really. I think it's okay. But you might not be here in 20 years to find out unless you eat this now. 
given sufficient need, most of us would proceed with perseverance and survival over minimal risk that might be encountered. Then this question, should biotechnology be used to feed the poor, is more than annoying. It's morally insulting. It insinuates that if you feed the poor, they will make more poor. So what's the consequence? You send them to their grave so they won't make more poor and be a burden on you? Really? Should we use biotechnology to feed the poor? Who's going to make that decision? The first world or the third world? Need, risk, perseverance, survival. And it also misses an important point. By feeding people, is that what causes increasing population? This has not been demonstrated. What actually decreases population has been shown to be the influence of education, purely education. As education resources increase, population decreases. As a matter of fact, if you keep young women in school to the age of high school, population decreases. It's been shown that if you subsidize school lunches alone, it'll have the effect on increasing population in developing countries and population goes down. Increasing education in developing countries and population goes down. So feeding the poor will keep the poor lo alive long enough for perhaps other innovations to take effect. This is not an easy question. There will be 10 billion people. World population is growing faster than increases in food supply. I already mentioned that the United States is the land of waste. We may waste more food in a single day than many countries consume in a year. There are now 7 billion people on the planet. By 2050, there will be 10 billion people. Who's going to feed those people? Can agriculture be sustainable on the plan that we have now? The essay on the principle of population by Thomas Malthus was published in 1798. Interesting essay, and it's been pointed out by many statisticians as well as economists that it's flawed in many ways. That population might be disrupted by many ways that it weren't accounted for in 1798. Wars, pestilence, uh, famine, things that would decrease population. Also, it's been pointed out that innovation itself by humans will impinge upon population growth. And I've already mentioned the effect of education on population. Nonetheless, if you look at population growth over this period of time shown in the graph on this slide, we are increasing exponentially. And we have uh, at least uh, for the last uh, several hundred years. And likely we will continue to do so. How many people can the world support? What is the carrying capacity of the planet? We can look at this ecologically in terms of other species. It's been said that one black bear requires 50 square miles or more. One black bear. How many square miles does it take to sustain a human? 90% of the population increase in the next 30 years will be in third world cities. Here's a picture of Mexico City, the world's largest city in the world. Also on this slide, I bring up this title, How Many People Can the World Support? Uh, that was published in this essay by J.H. Fremlin in 1964 in this compilation by Garrett Harding titled Population, Evolution, and Birth Control. I think this book is out of print, and one of my students walked off with it. I had one of the last remaining copies and curse him, but actually I hope it went to good use. It was a very interesting book 
uh, with compilations of essays on various different topics that are related to this. And you may remember Garrett Harding as famous for the essay called Tragedy of the Commons. Are you all familiar with this? Tragedy of the Commons uh, speaks highly unto itself in the title alone. The Tragedy of the Commons. If, if you're in the Northeast in the United States, you're familiar with the Commons as an area in colonial villages that was established in the central part of town as a green space. And the town was constructed around this green space as a place where the people of the town could congregate, they could uh, feed their cow, they could have a picnic lunch, uh, they could more or less converse with other people in peace uh, around this central commons. Even in developing Manhattan, there was a central commons uh, down around what is now Canal Street. There was a pond called the Clear in lower Manhattan that uh, had brook trout as long as my forearm and that you could drink the water that led out of that stream as it went down to the Hudson River with brook trout in it. Well, you know, that's obviously paved over. I have stood on that spot. And where the stream led out is now what is called Canal Street. But the commons is gone, isn't it? And the commons, the commons in uh, the village of colonial times, also, uh, sooner or later, uh, maybe one cow was OK. And as the village grew, 20 cows really put a stress on things, not to mention the attitude of the picnickers on Sunday. And pretty soon, there was no grass left in the commons. And the commons collapsed, if not disappeared. There wasn't enough resources in the commons to sustain the growing population of the village. OK, we're in a global village. What's the commons? The commons is now the planet. How much resources can we take from the commons if it's all accessible, really? Tragedy of the Commons by Garrett Harding. But let's go back to this article by J.H. Fremlin. How many people can the planet support? It's very interesting that he wrote this article in 1964, and I love the way it starts off. The wor and this is 1964. The world population is now 3,000 million people, and increasing at a rate corresponding to a doubling time in, <clears throat> in 37 years. You know, that's an interesting statement because he's just basing that on Malthusian mathematics. He was right, right to the year. We doubled not only the US population in 37 years, but globally. So right away, he catches my attention. You know, he's got some credibility here right in the first line. But Let's just play out his mathematics. Uh, and I think as the economists would criticize Malthus, we can also criticize J.H. Fremlin. But let's just go with this equation. So if we go with this doubling time of every 37 years, and we are now in exponential growth, then we will have 400 billion people in 260 years. And what the result would be is elimination of all land wildlife and a complete use of land for agriculture, 400 billion people. In 370 years, 3,000 billion people. Only food source is single-celled algae. 450 years, 15,000 billion people. Light and phosphorus are now limited. 680 years roughly the time of a single Chinese dynasty. One million billion people, and the only thing left to eat is Soylent Green. If you remember, it's an ancient movie now, but Soylent Green is people. Well, that's a little overblown, albeit. Um, owing to the facts that impinge upon environment. The US is now at zero population growth, owing to a lot of factors which mitigate the J.H. Fremlin argument. But I think it is uh, informative, if not science fiction. But really, today, let's get back to today. People are starving 
Around the world, 40,000 people die each day from starvation, silently, out of the view of most people in the United States. One million people die of vitamin A deficiencies every year. I brought up the technology called golden rice, which through genetic modification could apply vitamin A through rice sources globally. Given that that was introduced in the 1990s, this has still not made it through to worldwide production. So who's going to feed these people? The North, that is the Northern Hemisphere, or will this technology now be developed in developing countries? The man who has bread has many problems. The man who has no bread has one, whether that's GMO bread or organic bread. Famously, Norman Borlaug was recognized as the founder of the Green Revolution and awarded the Nobel Prize in 1970 for his contributions to developing high-yielding wheat crops. These were dwarf wheat varieties that produced more grain per acre. It can be argued that the increase in fertilizer also uh, resulted in the Green Revolution, but more food per acre was the result. I saw Norman Borlaug. Norman Borlaug was an alumni of uh, where I did my graduate work at Iowa State. Um, and I, I saw him give a lecture in which someone in the audience, an anti-GMO person, said, what do you think about GMOs? And he said, you got a better idea? Bring it on. So he wrote this article called Ending World Hunger, The Promise of Biotechnology informing us of the tools to which biotechnology brings, not as a panacea, but certainly, as I keep reiterating in these lectures, another tool in the box. Can you afford to take that tool out of the box, really? And if you can, what's the better tool? Could it be that some applications of biotechnology are morally good, while some are morally wrong. You pointed out the ability to create recombinant insulin and its effect on treating diabetes. Is this somehow morally good while using GMO crops to feed people is morally wrong? And who makes that decision, really? Can detailed public debate be used to choose? Certainly an informed public is better than a misinformed public. Can a balance between perceived benefits and known risks be used to evaluate these questions? Right now we can see education out of balance. And clearly this is resulting in uh, policy making uh, without information or evidence based knowledge. The implementation of biotechnology, whether it's agriculture, medicine, or pharmacy, futuristically going forward, is moving much faster than the public education. We can now clone any gene and move it into any organism. Big deal. What is the public education? Public education tells us that most students aren't aware of what a gene is or that we can now sequence any genome we want. What are the implications of this moving forward? As we move faster, as the technology moves faster than an educated public, how are we going to make adequate policies that relate to this growing population and its environmental situations? So there is no meaningful public discussion, uh, and there are no collective decisions. So monumentous collective moral decisions about biotechnology are now being made by an uninformed public by default. And I think that's wrong. Is the consumer adequately educated? Actually, we could even say, does the consumer really care? And that is another problem. 
in a situation where the consumer now distrusts science itself, how are we going to inform the public about the risks and benefits that these technologies bring? And I don't care whether it's GMO crops or the computer that's on your lap. What are the upsides and downsides of all of these technologies? And do we choose the higher good in a Kantian sense? Could it be that some application should be pursued for the higher good and the greater good of the public, unresponsive to individual choice? Suppose you were a farmer living in a country facing famine, and you had access to a genetically altered seed stock that was 30% more productive than your existing seed stocks, would it be morally wrong to refuse those bioengineered seeds to that farmer? In spite of what I've been saying about a distrust for science, polls also show that Americans are generally optimistic about science owing to the laptop on their laps. And, the techno and technologies that are, are new. Polls also show that Americans uh, are generally fairly adverse to risk taking. So benefits are okay, risks are not okay, and I think this is increasing. And that they're financially dependent on scientific progress and the development of technology. And obsessed with health. But this obsession with health is also contradictory in as many directions as you can possibly look. In an overweight country, people are less concerned about nutrition than they are about the amount of food that they consume, eager to accept benefits with limited risk. And what about the rest of the world? And this brings me back to Jared Diamond's quote. If we suffer from indecisions about these crops, should we label GMOs? Well, you know what? This is a temporary argument. Because very soon, everything is going to be GMO. Do you just want to just label everything GMO and get it over with? And what's the big deal anyway? Because a society that temporarily turned against a powerful technology would continue to see it being used by neighboring societies and would have the opportunity to reacquire it if it was useful by diffusion or it would be conquered by its neighbors if it failed to do so. And that is clearly the situation we are in regarding agricultural biotechnology or the technologies that I will re refer to in the remainder of this course. The history of science and technology itself and the public shows us that there have been few technologies that have been useful that were declined in spite of public dissent. Has there ever been a new technology that's been developed that has not been implemented by the public if it were useful? I like this slide showing the construction of the Trans-American Railroad, which obviously today would raise serious environmental consequences and maybe be denied on that alone. Turning into the DNA double helix before us. Yes, it's a challenge, but what do you do? Stick your head in the sand? Knowledge is power. Ignorance is bliss. Technology will proceed. So visualize world peas. The challenge is sustainable agriculture, global ecology. How much more rainforest can we cut down for agriculture in a growing population? What is the carrying capacity of the planet? Thank you.